Uh, okay, let us uh, let us begin. Uh, I know that uh, my friend uh, John Deutsch has a very rich life experience, but I don't think he ever had to compete with an espresso machine. Uh, <coughs> uh, uh, another uh, uh, another sort of brief observation. Uh, we do seem to to become more and more globalized. Uh, we were treated to a, to a very interesting presentation by a Frenchman who speaks very good English. Uh, we will, I'm sure, be treated to another great presentation by an American who I know speaks very good French, but he will address us in English. Uh, now, uh, uh, it's been my privilege uh, for years now to to have known and to have been a friend of. of John Deutsch, um, and uh, I'd like to, by way of introduction, to, to make two comments. I mean, he's, uh, he's a, an impressive man with a, with a very impressive record. Uh, first of all, a great scientist, a great uh, chemist, uh, a great academic administrator, was the, the provost of MIT, and was given by that uh, venerable institution the honor of becoming an institute uh, professor, which he is now. Uh, but uh, the United States uh, has found a way of creating <coughs> flexibility in the in, in its governing elite. People can can move, maybe not easily, but uh, uh, in many cases uh, quite freely uh, between the academy, uh, the government, and the corporate world. And uh, John belongs to uh, to that uh, to that elite. Um, he uh, I mentioned his uh, scholarly uh, credentials. Uh, he was uh, um, deputy secretary of state, uh, head of uh, director of central intelligence. Uh, previously to that, in the Department of uh, Energy, he sits on a number of major corporate boards, including uh, Citigroup, which in 2011 sounds better than in 2009, uh, and uh, therefore brings a, an unusually broad perspective in, into the subject matter. And uh, uh, we are all looking forward, John, to your sharing with us uh, your understanding of how the, this complex American system uh, crafts its national security policy. Please. Uh, distinguished um, resumes only come from being old, uh, uh, which uh, is a, a terrific disadvantage. Um, I'm delighted to be here with you today. I hope everyone can hear me. I'm very pleased to have been invited by Itamar Rabinovich, who is one of the great uh, diplomats that uh, I encountered in Washington, a great friend of mine, a person who I admire greatly. And also to see again my friend General David Ivry, who I worked with closely when he was a Director General uh, in the Ministry of Defense, and later on saw him also uh, perform distinguished service in Washington. Uh, I want to just remind you the range of foreign policy issues that the United States is expected to show a leadership role, not just to observe or participate, but to show a leadership role. So we begin with Afghanistan and Iraq, China and East Asia. Uh, I would also mention Africa, of course the Middle East peace process, Russia, European affairs, the uh, sort of functional areas of uh, energy and climate, economic matters, non-proliferation and the role of nuclear weapons, counterterrorism, not to mention what is on today's agenda of the uh, dis unrest in Egypt, in Tunisia, in Yemen, and in Lebanon. It is a very vast uh, set of issues that the United States must deal with, must show leadership in. But my assignment today is not to give you my views did I leave Iran off that list? I should not have done so. Uh, not to give you my views on all or any of these, 
but rather to offer some remarks on how the United States accomplishes its national security policy. And I want to do that in a way uh, that I don't suggest that the way we manage national security, security should be highly rated. I just want to report to you how I see that it operates and to make some observations. I will begin by just describing very briefly how we manage our national security. I want to make some observations about that, turn to two particular problems which I believe deserve, will receive attention in the United States, and then maybe say a word or two about the outlook for uh, the future. In the United States, national security affairs are uh, managed by the National Security Council, which is established by law. There are a core set of agencies that participate in this process, always the Department of State, the Department of Defense, the Intelligence Community, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the United Nations uh, Ambassador. Uh, the, that concern of that core group is with uh, political military affairs. When you get to other matters, additional agencies may participate. For example, in Homeland Security and Terrorism, we have the addition of the FBI and the Department of Justice and the Department of Homeland Security. In the case of Economic Affairs, the membership is expanded to include the Department of Treasury, the National Economic Council, the Trade Representative, and other agencies as the particular issue warrants. In practice, the management of the National Security Council and its activities is run by the National Security Advisor, who make no doubt about it, works for the President, and is the President's person. The President's person in both discussing what the issues are, setting the agenda, and regulating the process among the principals, the deputies, and the working groups that uh, execute the uh, business of the National Security Council. I want to make some observations about this. I think I'll make seven or eight. You will have heard them before, but you now hear them from an American perspective. My first question, I raise the first observation is, what does national security cover? How big a definition does it deserve? How much a big a definition does it have? In Israel, you have the issue of national survival, national continuity as being so central. In the United States, the definition continues to expand. It begins with political military matters. It goes on to uh, much broader economic questions. It goes to climate change. It goes to uh, issues having to do with the stability of the global financial system, poverty, and the like. My first observation to you is that while it is certainly true that in a good definition of national security that all affairs that affect men and women, all affairs that affect international and domestic matters should be covered, as a practical matter, the larger you make this definition, the more difficult it is to actually be competent in the management of it. The second uh, comment, observation I wish to make uh, really underscores something which Professor Dror said, and that is national security policy documents are almost always a disaster. Why? Because when you make a national security policy, you have words assembled by a large set of people who try and either cover up differences by ambiguity or guess, or guess what the uh, uh, intentions are of the president and therefore produce a document which usually overstates matters or does not clearly state matters in a way which is useful to the public or surely to ally allies. We have some marvelous examples of this. The national security policy issued at the beginning of the George W. Bush administration hounded him for a period of time because it left to such great ambiguity what he saw, what his administration saw the role of nuclear weapons to be for the present and for the future. The Obama administration has had a dreadful time issuing a national security document that conveys clearly and simply what their objectives are in Afghanistan.
So national security documents are not a way to decipher what the policy is or the doctrine or the practices of the United States. For that, you must look at what is actually going on, what matters are being done, and how they are being pursued. My third remark has to do with the terrible separation in the United States between domestic and foreign policy matters. We have a very uh, uh, well-organized national security system which covers national security matters, but when there are domestic issues that happen to overlap with foreign policy issues, these are not handled in any administration now or in the past uh, in a way which makes the coherence between the domestic and the international aspects uh, uh, harmonious. Now, I'm sure other countries like France, like Israel, do a better job of this, but in the United States it has been a chronic problem, especially in the area of energy, but it's everywhere. A good example of this is the current difficulties that we have uh, reconciling our long-term concerns about our strategic competition with China, with the internal economic consequences and the political consequences of having China be such a large holder of U.S. dollars, such a large exporter of goods to the United States. So this discordance between domestic and uh, foreign policy is uh, very, very serious indeed, especially when our political leaders from the president on down have a tendency to speak to domestic audiences without considering what the international implications may be or vice versa. The fourth point that I want to mention, and this I think is a vital shortcoming, is that the National Security Council and its apparatus has very little analytic capability. Now our previous speaker, I think General Ivy, spoke eloquently about the need to have some coherent national multi-year plan about where the country should be going. In fact, in order to do that, you must have access to some capacity for planning, for assessing how matters are going, for evaluating how the execution of the programs are proceeding. Indeed, we have very little capacity at the national security level in the United States to carry out such coherent planning. That capacity, to the extent it exists, and I will turn to this in a moment, is in the component agencies. The result of that lack of long-term thinking and planning at the national security level means, along with the pressure of the many issues that I described to you, means that the National Security Council process, the National Security Policy process in the United States functions best when it is responding to short-term crisis. It is very poor at long-term thinking. We have heard that point mentioned here earlier today. In crisis, the system works magnificently. Working groups are formed from the component agencies. The working groups prepare papers which have options in them for the principles of the National Security Council and ultimately for the President to consider and to make a decision. Absence of crisis, there is limited ability to focus the attention of the principles on serious issues. Let me say that in my judgment, good crisis management means bad long-term policy. Good crisis management does not lead to good long-term policy, and there are many, many examples in my own experience that I could, our uh, deployment of troops to Somalia, our deployment of troops to Haiti, our, even our deployment of troops to uh, Bosnia and Kosovo, meant they were done better in response to a crisis than into a long-term thinking about where this was going to lead for the uh, foreign policy interests of the United States or for the betterment of the people who we were uh, going to help. Uh, we have many examples of where this attention to the short term stops us from forming a longer term view. Uh, the issue of uh, uh, Iraq and Afghanistan, 
uh, now is very much uh, an example of this. And I fear that our approach to the Middle East and to uh, Islam, uh, as well as our current reaction to Egypt, reflects the same attention to a short-term response as opposed to a, a long-term thinking about what our interests are and where we are headed uh, over a multi-year period. And when I speak of a long-term effort in defining our national security policy, I don't only mean our political and our military activities, but I also included that economic assistance and our cultural efforts as well. Curiously, our National Security Council is very little involved in allocating resources. It could be involved, but it is, a not, it is not, in fact, very heavily involved in allocating resources to the various departments. This is another vital shortcoming of the U.S. system in my regard, it, in, my, in my opinion. It leads the problem of allocating resources, both in terms of quantity and in terms of area, to the agencies somewhat regulated by the Office of Management and Budget, but much more to a bilateral relationship between congressional committees that have authority for voting the money in Congress and the individual agencies. So in the important matter of resource allocation, we have the, the National Security Council having a relatively light hand. They could and sometimes do intervene in a particular situation, but they do not lay out a long-term allocation of resources to different activities. <clears throat> this means that people who want to influence resource, resource allocation, for example, industry and their lobbyists in Washington, respond at the agency level, and they seek to apply their influence at that level, and they do so quite effectively, oftentimes confusing U.S. intent, for example, the magnitude and character of arms sales to Taiwan, uh, the competition between having a tanker built by the European manufacturer EADS or by the uh, United States uh, by Boeing, uh, how to deal with export controls. All of these are matters that get dealt with at the departmental level where the bureaucracy and the mission of that particular agency frequently is in conflict with a broader national purpose. So only the Department of Defense has a resolute, multi-year, disciplined planning process that lays out for a five-year period what are the programs that are going to be supported, how much money they will receive, and how they will be managed, and even occasionally, in some cases, explicit measures of performance and milestones to be achieved. Because after all, as was said earlier, the most important part of national security policy is indeed the execution of the decisions that you arrive at. Now, I happen to favor the strength of the Department of Defense having a robust planning process. But in the course of this, along with the political dynamic that I mentioned of each department negotiating largely separately with uh, Congress for its funds, means that over time, the Department of Defense becomes stronger, especially under its splendid leadership of the past, while other agencies do not do not catch up and gain the kind of capability that they need to address the new threats that the United States and the rest of the world is uh, uh, facing. So, so this particular problem is a very serious shortcoming, in my judgment, in the United States. Let me make another observation. I make it fleetingly, and I make it very, very gently. What about the role of the press? Now, I know one is supposed to start the answer to that question with a statement, in a democracy, the press is, and then I leave you to fill in the rest of that. <laughs> uh, it has become, uh, in my mind, a, a serious issue for responsible private decision making uh, in our country. It significantly affects are the effectiveness of our diplomacy and the ability for us to reach 
responsible uh, national security decisions. Uh, uh, I, I cannot tell you how serious this matter of leaks has become. Uh, the United States has a history of uh, the intelligence community of producing national intelligence estimates. Frequently now they are declassified in, the, in advance of their disbursement in order to be able to have the administration put their explanation of what it says as opposed to relying on a leak to determine how uh, the public will uh, get this information. But the role of the press deserves attention, and in my mind uh, is a, a, another uh, issue that uh, we should consider. Uh, finally, I make a remark about international cooperation. Uh, the United States frequently is called upon in every situation to uh, look for international justification for the foreign policy actions it will take. We certainly are active and enthusiastic members of ASEAN, perhaps a bit less so of NATO, and perhaps even a bit less so for the United Nations. But I do see that one aspect of United States national security policy going forward will be a continual emphasis awaiting, not entirely, but awaiting towards U.S. interests and U.S. bilateral relationships rather than a rush towards a greater multilateralism, although it certainly is part of our approach. So these are my observations. Uh, they have been mentioned in many uh, instances uh, before. I now want to turn to uh, uh, two issues that are on my mind and I think remain to be resolved uh, in the United States national security policy system. The first has to do with how we are managing counterterrorism and homeland security. And it's really quite an interesting historical uh, case. For historical reasons, the responsibility for a domestic security and domestic intelligence collection to the extent that it existed has resided with the Federal Bureau of Investigation, while all foreign intelligence matters uh, uh, resided with the CIA and the Director of uh, Central Intelligence. Why did this come about? This came about because of a poor personal relationship between J. Edgar Hoover and Alan Dulles. It really was to settle a quarrel between them that it was decided in this way. Now that division worked well as long as the security concerns that we faced were sharply divided into peacetime and wartime, into domestic and foreign issues, between issues did it involve a U.S. citizen or did it not involve a U.S. citizen. All of those distinctions have vanished with the uh, emergence of global uh, terrorism. The result is a massive confusion about what is uh, governing the way we form our policy for counterterrorism and uh, homeland security. A massive confusion that means that we are less effective at pursuing these matters than we should be. And the main point is that there is a confusion about whether counterterrorism as it influences potential, and everything has that potential, of domestic impacts in the United States. Does it involve law enforcement? or does it involve national security? Now, unlike many other countries, better organized than we are perhaps, where domestic security and domestic intelligence are organized as part of the Department of Interior, in the United States, the FBI is part of our law enforcement system and is in the Department of Justice, which means that we have a, a, a very big confusion about whether the first intent, let's say, of intelligence collection is for warning and for avoiding terrorist acts, or whether the first intention of collecting information is for law enforcement and for punishment. The uh, 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 Intelligence Reorganization Act of 2005 allegedly was to put some harmony in this relationship by assigning to the new direct, director of national intelligence some authority over at least the planning and the direction of the national security activities of the FBI. I believe that that has been less true in practice than was originally uh, intended. 
And I will also say that I believe that there is a fundamental conflict of interest of having this responsibility for domestic security and intelligence in the Department of Justice, which is asked at the same time to manage these enterprises and also be an honest judge of whether the rules by which these activities are pursued are being followed or not. The Justice Department is asked to be both manager, overseer of the activities, and also judge about whether they are being properly carried out. This means that we have some very serious issues that have not been resolved as clearly as I believe they should be. The most obvious one in the public debate, and it is a serious one, are our rules for apprehension, detention, and interrogation of alleged terrorists, something which has not been solved. Our rules for cybersecurity, which has been mentioned here, is a very much of a growing uh, issue of concern to industry, individuals, and the military, and our carrying out of certain uh, covert action activities around the world. So this problem about how do you divide concern for the privacy, the legal rights, and the privileges of all your citizens, at the same time carry out adequate attention for national security, obtaining warning, and avoiding catastrophe is something that deserves. Uh... Another problem has been that the Department of Homeland Security has yet to acquire the capability needed for it to be a major actor in the national uh, uh, security policy arena. Uh, they do not have the capability in terms of activities beyond the very considerable capability that resides in their component divisions, whether it's the Coast Guard or the Immigration and Naturalization Service, to put together a, uh, uh, a coherent concern to a, very lar to a possibility of a very large domestic uh, catastrophe. Earlier, uh, uh, Professor Heisborg mentioned Katrina. I remember being in a meeting uh, in an earlier case with the then head of FEMA, a quite uh, able fellow, who said, Mr. President, Mr. President, let me tell you something about the Federal Emergency Management Administration. We are resourced and we are planned to protect ourselves against natural disaster. We do not have the money or the ability to take care of human concerned uh, uh, disasters. So we do not have a system which has the capability for dealing with these uh, extreme cases. So we still have to face this issue of the balance between law enforcement and its legitimate purpose in making sure rules are followed and national security and the ability to uh, uh, defend the United States and provide warning from uh, potential hostile activities. The second issue that I want to mention to you concerns the health of the intelligence community at a time when there are a whole range of new threats, counterterrorism, as I've mentioned, proliferation, and, uh, of course, all of the uh, uh, instability and uh, issues that we see here in the Middle East. In fact, the intelligence community, in my mind, is still suffering from the uh, uh, mistakes that occurred uh, in the 1990s, the uh, incorrect estimate shared by many others, other services, about the existence of weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, and also the inability to predict, as if it's possible for any service to do this, the attacks on the United States in 9-11. Uh, there's still uh, uh, a uh, results of that, uh, those failures, have led to public, some public and official lack of confidence in the community, and therefore some loss of morale uh, within the community. The Director of National Intelligence, which was set up under the 2005 Reorganization Act, a action which at the time I testified in favor of to the horror of my former boss and predecessor, James Rodney Schlesinger, uh, uh, I testified in favor of it, has really not worked as well uh, as uh, expected. The Director of National Intelligence does not have authority 
over the military intelligence parts of the program as much as was originally intended, and certainly the matters between the national security divisions of the uh, Department of Justice and FBI and the uh, intelligence community have not been fully harmonized. Community staff has exploded from a mere 40 or 50 that I had when I was director of central intelligence to something like 1,400 today. So much of the time of intelligence individuals in Washington are spent keeping their eye on each other rather than paying attention to the central functions of collecting information, analyzing information, and uh, distributing that information to senior policy uh, makers. A lot needs to be done, I think, to strengthen intelligence for what it needs to do in today's world. My friend Leon Panetta, who is now director of the CIA, who was the head of Office of Manage and Management and Budget when I was in the Department of Defense, trying to control my budget, I will come back to that, is spending a good deal of his time on activities in Afghanistan instead of, perhaps instead of, perhaps in my mind not balanced enough towards providing analysis of where Afghanistan is going, where is Pakistan going, where are our interests in that region, and what are our long-term actions that we should be taking uh, attention to. Uh, I conclude with uh, uh, this question about outlook. What is the outlook for national security policy in the United States? And I'm going to straight, state my con uh, principal conclusion in an overly provocative way. And that is, budgets are national security. Budgets are national security. You can have all the principles you like, all the organization you like, the endless numbers of meetings. If you don't have the resources planned and allocated and executed in a sound way, you will not have an effective national security policy, or worse yet, you will not have a foreign policy that reflects the interests of your country. Now, uh, my colleague, Stan Fisher, showed an unbelievably attractive display of the defense budget of Israel here yesterday evening. I looked at it uh, by the, my breath. I took an intake because U.S. defense budgets are not of that character. They go up, they go down, they go up, they go down. And they go up and they go down very, very sharply. I want to remind you when I was Deputy Secretary of Defense 12 short years ago, I had to suffer with a total budget of about $345 billion. Today that budget is $800 billion. Now I want to say that it is not going to continue at that level. It is not going to continue at that level. It just isn't going to happen. And in the past, if you look at the history from the Second World War of U.S. budgets versus U.S. policy, one is, you could first say, is there any correlation at all? That's one question. But the other is the certainty that it goes up and it goes down. And it is about to go down. And in my judgment, it is about to go down quite, quite significantly. Why is it about to go down? It's about to go down because of the fiscal crisis and the very large increase in deficits which have occurred in the United States. It's about to go down because of what I would call sticker shock, but my friend's, friend Professor Heisberg has more properly termed it the invention of uh, Norm Augustine, which says every time you look at a, uh, a, a weapon system, its price has doubled compared to what you saw last time, and there's tremendous sticker shock in Congress on both sides of the aisle to the uh, magnitude of these defense uh, expenditures on components, for example, like the Joint Strike Fighter. So we are going to see a decline in the budget of the, uh, applied to not only defense now, but I also speak of national security, the uh, uh, associated expenditures which are much more needed in the Department of State to carry out the peacekeeping operations and the economic assistance that makes peacekeeping even a possibility, a remote possibility, in a place like Somalia or Rwanda or in uh, Haiti or in Iraq or in Afghanistan. Uh, very sharp reduction in, in those budgets in my, in, in my mind.
Now, if you have a sharp reduction in a budget, you cannot maintain the same national security objectives that you have. If you keep the same objectives and you accept a much lower budget, you are not, you're not dealing candidly with the character of the problem. And so my second remark is that because of this pressure on budgets, we're only beginning to see now in the remarks made by Secretary Gates is that there will be a change in the national security and foreign policy posture of the United States to conform with the reality of the resources that they're going to be able to bring to bear on these issues. Now, whether that happens in the most likely area, which is peacekeeping operations, I can't predict. But I can say to you that there will be a significant change, in my judgment, in the breadth and ambition of the national security policy that the United States has been following over the past uh, decade. So uh, I conclude by saying uh, thank you very much for inviting me here. I have learned a great deal from listening to this discussion. It reminds me about how differently uh, countries uh, do address these vital issues to uh, the national security and national welfare and how while we may organize ourselves differently, we certainly off, almost always encounter the same troubles in trying to serve the people. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, uh, Professor Deutsch. Uh, we have some time for uh, Q and A. Uh, let me let me uh, arrogate the first uh, question to myself, uh, John. I don't know if you read the book by Peter Rodman, Presidential Command. Uh, uh, yeah. Okay. So let me, uh, Peter Peter Rodman. Uh, came into government with Henry Kissinger from Harvard and served in practically every uh, Republican administration uh, in foreign policy or defense uh, positions until his untimely death. And his book, Presidential Command, is a review of uh, the fashion in which every president since uh, uh, Richard Nixon and ending with George W. Bush conducted his... Uh, national security policy, and uh, he's grading them, and we'll skip that, but on the basis of that very interesting book, I wanted to ask you to address two issues. One is the personal imprint that the president puts on this system. He described a very complex uh, infrastructure system, and obviously the persona of the president and the president's familiarity or understanding of National security issues must have a lot to do with the way his administration uh, functions. And the second uh, is an issue that you alluded to briefly, but I'd like you to expand on, is this uh, international warfare uh, between and among the several agencies. And, uh, in the Rodman book, describes a, a very unpleasant uh, uh, portrayal particularly of the George W. Bush administration with the infighting uh, the Secretary of Defense, Secretary of Foreign Affairs, the National Security Advisor trying ineffectively to navigate that and so forth and so forth. So if you can address these two issues, I'd be very grateful. The, the first word reminded me of the, the persona of the President. Can it, is this, uh, yeah. Well, I've only dealt personally and closely on uh, national security matters with three presidents, Carter, George H.W. Bush, and uh, Clinton. And there's no question about the fact that each one of them had a different interest in uh, national security matters. The person who had the most global interest uh, evidently was George H.W. Bush because he had been ambassador in Beijing, he had been UN ambassador, and he had been 
director of central intelligence. Uh, the person who had the most selective and deep concern was uh, President Carter, who, of course, adopted non-proliferation in his, what he was interested in the greatest depth and pursued with the greatest personal interest, although he did have other successes like uh, 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 the peace uh, process. Kim David. Yeah, Cat David. Uh, the problem with President Clinton is he was interested in everything. And therefore, uh, I, in my judgment, never really had uh, uh, as much uh, of an impact. You did have NATO enlargement. Whether that's a good thing or a bad thing uh, is certainly up for debate. Uh, he tried very hard and expended enormous effort on an agreement with Syria. But uh, fundamentally, he was uh, all over the map, and then he was also saddled with this tremendously complicated problem of Bosnia, which was not really addressed through a NATO, effective NATO uh, uh, involvement for three years. So my, my view would be uh, it's all these chaps have different interests, and they're not all the same or universal. With respect to interstate warfare, it depends. It's always present. It depends on which administration. I must say that in the first Clinton administration, there was not this great controversy between state and the intelligence community and defense because fundamentally the three leaders of those uh, um, agencies got along very well and saw each other all the time and had good personal relationships. It doesn't have to be the case with uh, a good co national security advisor and good secretaries that intercede warfare is not present. Thank you. Yeah, well, Dad. Uh, thank you, Professor Deutsch. Uh, I am coming back. At Maybe take the, the microphone. To the, <laughs> to the issue of uh, Egypt. Walk us, if you can, through a debate, an imaginary debate, of not imaginary debate, that took place sometime in, uh, on Sunday, uh, last Sunday, that on, on Egypt. What, uh, how, is, how is the president conducting such a national security policy and forum debate? What do you think will be, would have been the different positions uh, expressed in this debate by the various agencies? I mean, in, a, in the most vivid way, if you can. Well, uh, again, uh, certainly less clear or succinct had I been there. But uh, other than that, the most important, uh, significant, promising step that I see, I've seen. Is that you, uh, here? Uh, at the end, they don't. Take, 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 this one. take this one. Is the uh, that uh, Secretary Clinton has sent uh, uh, Frank Wisner to uh, Egypt? Uh, have you, did you see that? That he's been been sent to to Egypt. Frank Wisner is the former uh, ambassador to Egypt. He's a former Under Secretary for Policy in the Department of Defense. He's a senior ambassador. Was also our ambassador to India. Uh, uh, and Frank Wisner is a person of enormous skill. And uh, I'm sure we'll repeat the message that I would have thought that all of the senior foreign policy people would have said, number one, it's been clear for some time that there is going to be a transition in Egypt. Uh, and number two, it's clear that there's a lot of social and economic stress in Egypt that is one day going to have to be dealt with. The United States doesn't pick successor regimes. The United States has worked very closely with Egypt and has no basis for criticizing that past conduct, the present, the present uh, uh, government, or to make comments about the relative attractiveness of alternative governments, which I'm perfectly happy to offer to you in a smaller group. But I will say this that the press has shown the United States in what I find a very surprisingly aggressive role in uh, stating a preference for regime change, which I don't think serves common sense or their interests because nobody knows what's going to happen. And I regard the assignment of Frank Wisner there as being an important way of 
reducing the uh, level of dialogue. Thank you. I enjoyed uh, very much your, uh, your talk as much as I enjoyed the, the previous one about France and uh, of course about Israel's uh, management of national security. Um, imagine, well, I'm a simple businessman in the most simplistic terms and uh, reasonably successful at that. If I would run the company that I'm in charge of and now other businesses reasonably large businesses that run their businesses quite successfully. But if I, value, if, I, if I put on a scale how the three countries that I've listened to now, how they run the national security, I must get very alarmed. That, uh, and, and I suppose we have these many of these crises in the world because the issues are not attended to properly. There's confusion, what I'm told. There are personal uh, agendas. There are uh, politics. There are ministries and uh, bureaucrats, and they're all fighting over what to do, how to do it, and how much money to spend. And I haven't heard from the three countries that there is one person that, has really, that really knows what to do and what to decide about these issues. Everybody keeps taking my microphone. I don't know where that's... Uh, uh, first of all, I, I will say to you uh, that um, I disagree that what this confusion that is so present in democratic societies to one degree or another reflects a poor dealing with crisis as much as it reflects lost opportunity. That's what bothers me the most, that over time, much more could have been accomplished to improve prosperity, to improve participation in government, to improve peace around the globe if the leading countries of the world had gotten their act together and were well managed. Uh, uh, after the fall of the Berlin Wall. So I regard it more as not that we've had accidents or crises, or, but rather that we've lost opportunities. And second of all, uh, I've uh, not run a successful business, but I've been on many board of directors of large companies, and I would say to you that I don't find them as innocent and as uh, uh, free of these kinds of problems as you suggest, but I'm glad to know that your company is. Uh, yes, at the very end, uh, microphone please to, to the very end. Here is your microphone. Mr. Deutsch, Udi Segal from Channel 2 News. Uh, look. I'll try my voice louder. Mr. Deutsch, two questions, please. Regarding Egypt, what do you think is the message that the two kings Abdullah of Saudi Arabia and Jordan are getting from the so fast betrayal of United States of uh, President Mubarak, or what it seems like uh, in the media? Um, this is what one question. And the second question is after your, uh, one of the former CIA director, Wilsey, spoke about it, and Kissinger spoke about it. Do you think that Jonathan Pollard should be free after 25 years in jail? My answer to your first question is I don't understand it. And my answer to your second question is I have no comment. <laughs> uh, sorry. Uh, okay. Uh, <coughs> Uh, le uh, uh, John, let me let me perhaps uh, let me perhaps rephrase rephrase the first question, which in a way you you responded to earlier. That that I think that uh, Israelis understand uh, that the United States needs to deal with a new situation in a country that is of immense importance to the United States. It's made a huge investment in Egypt under Mubarak. Worked very closely with Mubarak. Obviously, came to the conclusion that uh, 
this, the present state of affairs cannot be maintained, that there have to be a measure of change, and it wanted to encourage Mubarak to to move with the traffic and not to not to become an, an obstacle and not to find itself having to defend an, an, an undefendable uh, monarch. But what struck people here and what what may resonate in the region is the swiftness uh, with which he was abandoned. So if the administration were to say, uh, you know, we uh, President Mubarak has been an ally, we've worked closely for 30 years, he's made a big contribution, but we do urge him to listen to his people and, and move on with reform would have been one thing. But the, the, the sense here was, and I think elsewhere in the region, that in no time there was not a, a positive word after 30 years of collaboration and a, sort of a cynical adaptation to, uh, to the new reality, which if you live in, uh, in the Persian Gulf and you look at Iran and think, can I rely on on the United States, in, you know, when, when the clouds uh, darken, is an issue. Uh, let me uh, make two points. The first one is a word that I rarely use, but I urge on everybody here, and that is patience. Let's wait and see how this develops. We're dealing here with the first week or ten days, and uh, I've always found that it's useful to try and be a little patient and see how matters emerge, and what develops. That's my first point. And my second point is, you ask me to do something that I cannot do. I am not a member of this administration. I do not know the message that they wanted to put out or the fidelity with which it's been placed in the newspapers. So I urge patience on this issue. I will say that I agree with a point that the United States has had a very constructive relationship with Egypt over three decades. And it will have a constructive relationship, I hope, in future decades. How this transition occurs is principally a matter for Egyptian, which, which Egyptian people will decide, regardless of what is said in Tel Aviv or in Washington, and we are going to have to live with that in the future. But I cannot defend for you and explain the comments of officials which I haven't spoken to about this matter. Thank you. I, uh, uh, I think that the appointment of Frank Wiesner was a great move, and apropos of your exchange with uh, Mr. Lowy, Frank Wiesner has been, been a very senior diplomat and, and official, and also vice chairman of AIG. He would be in a position to compare <laughs> the government and the corporate world. <laughs> Right. I take it. Uh, yeah. Take okay. I I want to I want to thank uh, <coughs> uh, John Deutsch for a fascinating, open, courageous, uh, enlightening presentation. Uh, before before I invite you to lunch, let me uh, advise you that uh, uh, there uh, there are devices uh, uh, for translation. Uh, Chancellor Merkel, who will address us in the afternoon, will speak in German. She can take questions in English, but she responds in, in German. So uh, translation service is available, and, and, and do take your earpieces uh, when you come in back from lunch. And in the meantime, bon appétit.